um, thank you so much for hosting us. And an honor to be with this uh, Renaissance man, polymath, uh, Marcus. And in fact, we, we've decided we might actually mention not one, but two books now. So you're getting extra value from this conversation. Uh, and we know that AI is, um, is, is definitely um, the kind of story of the day that everyone's fascinated by. So we'll start off with a little bit of AI. Uh, but first of all, though, um, and I hope you're all wide awake. I hope you've all had lots of coffee, because Marcus has a challenge for the audience, a mathematical challenge. Yeah, you, you, no, you thought you were coming to enjoy yourselves, there. but th this, is, this is double maths on a Friday morning. Oh, oh yes. Absolutely. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> There is an exam, and you will have to hand in your papers at the end. Yep. So I thought I'd start off with a little challenge. To Low kind marks of stimulate, uh, followed by eviction, is that yeah. right? <laughs> St stimulate the neurons. If you get it wrong, yeah, you're, you're, you're taken off the island. Uh, uh, so so uh, I understand there are 201 guests here on Suneva Fushi this weekend. Um, and uh, I, the challenge is, if we all wanted to shake each other's hands, uh, the 201 people, how how many handshakes would we need to do in order that everyone could shake each other? You know, it's all about uh, meeting new people. So uh, how many handshakes would we need to do in order to be able to, so that the 201 people would shake everybody else's hand, everyone would shake each other's hands? So there's a little challenge for you. 402,000. Uh, 402,000. Okay, we'll come and see whether that's correct. <laughs> Fanny <laughs> Lau, straight out the starting blocks. I'm impressed, there. yeah. Oh, respect. Right now, okay, Marcus. Let's. Nobody's start... going to listen anymore. They're all going to be. <laughs> let's start off with the creativity code, and um, let, let Marcus, your book on AI, the creativity code. What got you interested in AI? Well, I think we're. The story of AI is uh, all over the place and having a massive impact on society, uh, making decisions about what books we might read, films we'll watch, driving our cars. But I think there was always one thing that we felt that AI would never be able to do that humans are good at, which is our creativity. That somehow creativity is an expression of what it means to be human and how could AI ever do that? Um, and actually, as a mathematician, I think many people think I'm, I'm actually a computer doing sort of multiplication and long division to lots of decimal places and things. But actually, mathematics itself is a hugely creative subject, and science as well. But there, a lot of imagination, intuition, leaps in. You sounded a bit half hearted when you said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we mathematicians, this is why I'm a They're literary such snobs, vessel. these pure we mathematicians. Are, we are, yeah. Yeah. You have to do experiments and get your hands dirty with bubbles and neutrons. I'm just like imagining new worlds that. Um, so I, I think there is something slightly different, and we might discuss that about mathematics and uh, science. Um, but. Uh, but I always use this word creativity as my sort of uh, protective shield about why I thought AI couldn't do mathematics. Because mathematics isn't just about computation, it's about storytelling um, and uh, choosing those stories which engage our emotions. I, I create mathematics in order to kind of excite my audience about a strange journey and a strange connections between things. And that's an emotional journey. And how on earth could AI understand what excites me mathematically? But then a, a story uh, emerged where I s saw the first example of computer creativity. And th this is what started this journey of this book, which was, this is creativity in the context of a game. Um, the, there's a game called Go, a Korean game, Chinese game, which is incredibly complex. It's played on a 19 by 19 grid. And you place black and white stones. It's very simple because all you're doing is putting black and white stones down and you win the game if you can enclose more of your opponent's territory than they do of yours. But this game has always been very difficult for um, coders to write code to play at a particularly high level because to play the game requires a lot of pattern recognition, intuition about what's happening on the board. The complexity of the game is such that as the game goes on, it gets more and more complex. Um, you may remember the story when a computer played chess at a very high level, beat Gary Kasparov in the 90s. Chess is a much more kind of, log it's, it's perfect for a computer because it's the logical implications of moves. You see how many uh, steps ahead. It's much easier to program a computer top down in this way to play chess. But this kind of intuitive pattern recognition was something that you know, just code was unable to achieve. But 
we've seen a phase change in the way code is being written, and that's why I think this is a really exciting moment in AI. We've had AI winters for like decades. Suddenly we're in an AI heat wave where something really exciting is happening. Where code, instead of being written in this top-down manner, which really means that a human is really in control, just telling a machine to do things at speed and at depth, but any creativity that comes out the other end is really the human who programmed it. But that's changed because now code is being written in this bottom-up manner, something called machine learning, which some of you might have heard about, which allows the code to change and mutate, rewrite itself as it encounters new um, data, new environments. Um, and so the human starts it off, but gradually the code mutates, changes, and becomes something quite distinct from the human who started the journey. And so in the case of this game of Go, um, what they did was they didn't program the computer to play the game. They, they let the computer learn how to play the game by looking at human games, seeing the kind of patterns that seem to uh, help one player over another. And then when it ran out of human games, it started playing, making synthetic games. It played itself and it gradually built itself up um, and changed, mutated, and became something that was powerful enough to challenge the, the best we humans have this game is a guy called Lee Sedol, a Korean player. He was really dismissive, said this, no code has ever got anywhere near the intuition and, uh, that a human has to play the game. He lost that match four, four games to one. And the one game he did win, he now regards as the most valuable win of his whole career because he realized how powerful this thing is. Now, that isn't so extraordinary. We know stories of computers doing things better than humans. What was so exciting was something that happened in the second game. Um, early on in the game, your Go master teaches you that you should play just on the edges of the board. Somehow that's where the early competition happens. And so I watched these uh, rather compulsively on YouTube live because I realized if a computer can play this game, it might actually be able to do what I do as well. So, um, and there was um, a moment when the AI, interestingly, the AI did the thinking, but it still wasn't good enough to pick up the stones to put it on the board. So there was still a human, uh, this is still an amazing piece of equipment. Uh, robotics isn't good enough to, so a human was putting the things on the board. And it made a move, um, and I, I remember the gasp of the commentators when it made this move said, wow, that's an absolutely terrible move because it was very deep into the center of the board. And traditionally that is considered a very weak move early on in the game. Um, and so the, the commentators are very excited because they thought, okay, well, Lisa Dole will be able to win from this point on. Lisa Dole had actually been having a, a cigarette on the top of the hotel where they'd been playing. You know, computers don't, don't need nicotine to stimulate there, but we humans still need a little bit of something, caffeine, nicotine. So he came down and he saw this stone. I remember seeing the shock on his face, like, that's a terrible move. What on earth has it done that for? But he was already a little bit nervous and suspicious. He lost, lost the first game. It was like, there's something going on here. And he just couldn't see what it was. Um, towards the end of the game, uh, competition for territory emerges from the bottom right-hand corner of the board. And it turns out that that move, move 37, so early on in the game, is the move that won AlphaGo that second game. And... Um, uh, and, and for me, what's exciting is this, I think, passes three tests of what I think you should call a creative move. And defining creativity is quite a challenge. You know, how would you define what creativity is? I rather like a definition that a cognitive scientist in the UK, Margaret Bowden, has come up with. She says it should pass three tests. It should be something which is new. Okay, computers can make new things quite easily, but um, it should be surprising. So that's something which is engaging our emotions, making us sort of react and think, oh, what's going on here? Um, but that's something very subjective. Surprise of one person will be very different from something for another. And then the third thing, it shouldn't just be surprise for shock value. That's not interesting. It should have value in its own right to somehow make us see the world in a new way, change our perspective on things. Now, I think this move passed those three tests. It was a new sort of move. It surprised us all because we thought it was such a terrible move. You know, everyone went, oh, it's terrible. But ultimately, a game is where you can judge value very cleanly because this move won AlphaGo the game. So uh, I think this was a, a really creative new way of playing the game. And it was the creativity of the computer and the AI, not the human, because it had grown out of its learning process and if a human had seen this line of code, they would have deleted it and said, no, that's, that's a bad way. You don't play that way. So for me, this was the beginning of this journey to see, wow, 
this AI is doing something really new. It's, it's really teaching us to do things in new ways. Um, the game of Go is now played in a new way, thanks to AI yeah. revealing this. Um, I have this kind of image in the book quite often where we feel we've found, as humans, the peak way of uh, doing something, like playing a game or, or the music we compose. Um, and what's exciting is seeing AI actually push us off this little, uh, which what we thought was the Everest, and then showing us, no, this is just t some tiny hill, and there's a much better way to do things. Um, so this narrative of uh, AI and humans is often sort of uh, coached in the idea of a competition, competitive. Hollywood loves the dystopic idea of AI wiping out humanity. I wanted to write a much more optimistic book here where I think this is about collaboration, AI being a new way of seeing things and helping us to be more creative as humans. I think as creatives we often get stuck in ways of mechanistic ways of thinking. Yeah. Uh, you know, a composer will just compose the same thing over and over again, which is variety. Uh, in the book I talk about stories of uh, a jazz improviser in Paris, pianist, who when he improvised with a, an AI jazz improviser that trained on his music, suddenly realized there were new things he could do with, he said, I recognize that, that's all me. I've never thought of doing that before. And suddenly he was stimulated to do something really new. So, so I feel this is a really exciting moment where there's a new tool that we can use as humans to stop behaving like machines and actually open ourselves up to, to new ways of, of creativity. So, but, I, but I think, Marcus, it's, it's important to kind of frame this properly, you know, AI is becoming superhuman, but a very, very specific task, as Mark has said, you know, yes, it's AlphaGo developed by DeepMind, can be a Go master, um, but it's useless at anything else. And actually, um, there are different flavors of AI. Uh, in the olden days, there was what's called GoFi, good old fashioned AI, where people try to program in every rule and every circumstance for the AI, they'd like, they try to kind of recapitulate human knowledge in the AI. As Marcus says, now we've moved to deep learning, neural networks which are um, loosely based on the human brain in a kind of, in a way that a stick drawing is to the Mona Lisa. I mean, it's, it's so loose that I, I think it's almost worthless, that comparison, but they do learn. But in a strange way, I think we've, we've, we've replaced one form of brute force with another in that these um, neural nets are trained on endless games. They're looking for patterns, patterns that we might have missed. And so they're only as good as their training data. So I think, you know, although we should all, uh, we're a long way from general AI, but I think even with this new generation of AI, we have to be careful not to get carried away. So I'm going to pour a little bit of cold water on your AI <laughs> yeah, But I, I think you're right, actually. And one of the limitations is that very often if you're uh, training an AI, for example, to make music, uh, what we often do is just give it music to learn from. And, and this is a mistake because as humans, we have many different cultural influences which change that music. And a perfect example of this was um, I did a project in London uh, getting a piece of AI to learn how to compose like Bach. AI always starts with Bach, because Bach is a very kind of mathematical, algorithmic uh, sort of composer. Um, and uh, so it, it did amazing. We gave it all the uh, piano works of Bach, and then it, we gave it an, an exercise where I gave it a piece it had not seen before, one of the English suites. And we removed uh, sections of the piece and asked the AI to fill in the gaps. Um, so it was a sort of hybrid human AI piece. And then we played it at the Barbican. Uh, I had a, a friend of mine, Mahan Esfahani, who's a harpsichord player. Um, he played this uh, piece and we got the audience to kind of vote when they thought it went from human to AI. We, they had little, um, a little sort of red robot face and a blue. They couldn't tell at all. Just didn't know what, it was so Notice seamless. the red robot face, demonizing robots. Yeah, exactly. Come on, uh, give the robots a break. But That's what right. was fascinating was Mahan's response when, when we finished the, he said, wow, it was very convincing. He said, two things, I, I, I know this piece, okay, but there were two things which gave it away whenever it went to the AI. First of all, it was really difficult to play because the AI doesn't care about fingering and embodiment. So the AI isn't embodied. And so Bach wrote music that was also just easy to fall under the fingers. And it went, when it went to the AI, suddenly it was like, oh my God, this is really impossible. And then it came and went back. But the second thing was really interesting. Why are they called the English suites? 
Bach loved the cadences of different languages. And so um, he loved the way the English language, the, the, the way it goes up and down. And he had something called the, the French Suites, the Italian Concerto. The other really important ingredient in his data was the sound of language. And, and Mahan said, you never gave it any, you just gave it music, you didn't give it language. And I think for me, that's what's really exciting is the prospect of what do we start mixing the data such that it's visual, uh, written. Uh, there's a very interesting art project now, I was talking to one of the, the team at the back there about, called DALI, where you give the AI words, but it's been trained on words and images, and then it creates out of the words you've given it an image associated with those words. And it's kind of that mix of what does, how do, will a, an AI see from those words? It's sort of, but it, we're at a literary festival. Um, you know, how good is that? When are we going to have an AI up here at JLF, uh, yeah. Soneva yeah. Fushi, talking about his novel? Yeah. You know? You don't think so? Marcus, they'll never, no. well, they'll let me never read be you. a replacement for this man, no, I tell you. No, no, I'll tell you why uh, I'm going to give you he a little... He is beyond AI. I'm going to show you why we're, <laughs> we're safe. Somehow, music and visuals, but uh, the written word. So there was a, a team in America uh, of coders and artists called Botnik, and they're big Harry Potter fans. Um, and they were like really disappointed there are only like seven volumes of Harry Potter. So they, we want more Harry Potter. So they thought, well, why don't we just train an AI up on uh, J.K. Rowling's work and, and see whether it could produce a, an eighth volume. Um, so sure enough, they did this and it started, to, it, uh, the title it came up with is wonderful. It was Harry Potter and the pile of what looked like a large pile of ash. It's like, that's kind of intriguing. I'm already like, yeah, maybe I'm... A but, tad inelegant, I yeah, must say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But here's how the book started off, okay? Um, magic. It was something that Harry Potter thought was very good. Okay, well, it's already spotted from its learning process that magic is a major theme in these books. So I think it's doing pretty well. Um, leathery sheets of rain lashed at Harry's ghost as he walked across the grounds towards the castle. Now, I think that image of, you know, we've had a lot of rain here over the last few days, but leathery sheets of rain, what a nice image. I'm not sure I would have thought of leathery. So that came out of the learning process of the AI. There's a I, slight bondage thing going on here. Have you I, noticed? Yeah. Leather, I don't know. Has he been trained on other things? Ah, yeah, I wonder what he'd been doing. Uh, yes, exactly. But then from, from this point, the, 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 the AI really started to lose the plot, quite literally. So. <laughs> Ron was standing there and doing a kind of frenzied tap dance. Uh, he saw Harry and immediately began to eat Hermione's family. Ron's Ron's Ron shirt was just as bad as Ron himself. Um, so I, I think we, as authors, we're safe. What I love about this is, funny enough, I've just been, I've been working on another book with this guy, Peter Coveney. We've done two previous books, and we're we're actually interested in what we like to call big AI which is m mixing AI with a physics-based understanding of the world. And I think that anecdote you gave about um, piano playing was perfect because essentially a neural net is only as good as its training data. It doesn't understand anything about the way the world works. And so what we argue is that actually we need something called big AI, which is a blend of neural nets, but also what's called, you know, a physics-based, uh, an understanding of the parameters of what a pianist is able to do. Because without that, AI can come up with these crazy solutions. And actually, the Harry Potter, because AI's, again, got no understanding about, you know, you don't eat your family and rain, you know, but again, maybe there is this bondage thing that it was trained on. Who knows? Um, but, but, you know, but, but I think that is a fundamental weakness of the current generation of AI. Yes, it? but I think we're making a mistake, and it was a mistake I think Turing uh, made. Well, no, Turing started this whole initiative on artificial intelligence, AI, because he was interested in understanding the human mind and how it works. So he thought if we can program a computer to, to behave like a human, that will give us insight on what the brain is doing. Um, but what's interesting is, that was kind of a failure because it isn't very good at being human. It's not embodied and so it makes kind of silly mistakes and you know, the Turing test, quite often you can sniff out the AI versus the human. But I think that was a mistake. What we want, we know how to make uh, our human intelligence. We don't do it in the lab. We, we do it in the bedroom um, and make children and then we produce a, a little bit more of intelligence and that's much, much 
much more fun. Um, you know, um, there's a very seedy line from the whole AI thing coming through here from Marcus. No, 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 no. First bondage, now Benjamin. Marcus, please. Okay. It's 11 in the morning now. But I, I think what's exciting is creating an intelligence which is different from ours. It's like they can do something different. So I actually translate AI as like augmented intelligence or, uh, or alternative intelligence because and I think you know that project to try and embody and give the physics is, is all good well and good but there's a world that we are very bad at navigating which is the digital world actually it's, it's so complex so then you know, the data out there is not something that we humans because it's not embodied, trying to understand what's happening in these complex spaces, which are often not three-dimensional. They're the space of Netflix preferences of movies, if one looks at it mathematically, is like a 2,000-dimensional space. And you've got, there's no way. We have to make these projections down into two or three-dimensional graphs in order to understand preferences there. But an AI is absolutely happy living in a 2000 dimensional world it's um it's the right intelligence for that and that's why i think we should uh, exploit the fact that this is like galileo with a telescope being able to see deep into the night sky and see new things this is a, a the new ai that's emerging is a telescope to help us look into the digital world where we just don't have the sensory equipment to be able to understand what's happening at, in a 2000 dimensional digital space but the, this is probably a good time to segue into your new book because, of course, we, we can encapsulate our understanding of the world in, in the form of mathematical theories. These are the shortcuts that we come up with. Um, you know, Marcus, just, just tell us a bit about how you, you got from the creativity code to, to the new book and, and the link, the deep link between the two. Well, a journalist was interviewing me about this new book and by the end of the interview was so depressed that it's like, oh my God, there's nothing to be left. It could be creative as well. There's nothing left for humanity. So it's like, give me some hope. And I was like, ah, oh, okay. Um, and then I thought, actually, you know, one of humanity's saving graces, um, I believe, is our laziness. We don't like doing hard work. We like to, you know, uh, we like to find clever ways to think about things to avoid doing the kind of long, hard. Uh, you know, an AI just doesn't get tired. It's um, it, it will just keep on working on a huge. I mean, computers can just try a brute force method, like with the handshake thing. It can just try every yeah, it combination have to come out up with there, a you know, clever very quickly. way. Exactly. So, so I think uh, you know, laziness is one of the deadly sins. I don't think it should be at all. I think it's one of our, our great saving graces because <laughs> when faced with a like really complex problem, rather than just doing the hard, mechanical, boring work, uh, you know, what we do is to sit back and think maybe there's a better way to think about this. And actually the reason I became a mathematician, and this kind of starts the story of thinking better, is that uh, I was very, I wasn't a terribly good mathematician up to about 12 or 13. I just thought it was very boring, multiplication tables, nothing interesting. And then I was very lucky to have a teacher who, um, during, during one lesson, he started to just tell, he said, put your pens down, I'm just gonna tell you a story. Um, and we were like, well, stories in uh, the maths lesson? That was um, already intriguing. And he said, yeah, I'm going to tell you uh, the story about what mathematics is really about. Um, so he said, uh, right, I'm going to take you back to um, uh, the end of the uh, 19th century, uh, a classroom in Germany. A uh, teacher has decided to give the kids um, a challenge, uh, which is to add the numbers up from 1 to 100. I think the teacher thought, right, this is going to keep them going for ages because one, you know, the kids started off one plus two, that's three, plus three is six. Um, but before he'd even finished asking the question, one kid in the class, nine or ten year old, had written down a number, slammed it down on the desk and said, there's the answer. This is the young Carl Friedrich Gauss, who's one of my mathematical heroes. Um, and actually, he's sort of a, um, a companion throughout this whole book because he's really the master of mathematics and the master of what I call the, the shortcut, which is mathematics is about these clever ways of thinking about problems. So the teacher said, how did you get that so quickly? You haven't even done any computation at all. He said, yeah, all my friends are starting at the beginning of the journey and just trying, getting longer and longer and longer, and it's just going to take them forever. I realize you need to combine the beginning and the end of the journey. So he said, look, if you take 100 and 1 and add them together, you get 101. 99 plus 2 is also 101. 98 plus 3 is also 101. So you realize there are 50 pairs of numbers adding up to 101. So the answer is 50 times 101, 5,050. So he didn't have to do any 
uh, like computation at all, just stepping back and see seeing a new way to look at this problem just gave him a, a, this shortcut to um, solving the problem. And um, so my, my teacher said, that's what this subject is about. You know, most people go away thinking maths is hard work. It's totally the opposite. It's about finding the clever ways to think about something so you don't have to do that hard work of adding up the numbers. And the beauty of this shortcut is that, you know, what if the teacher said, oh, okay, well, you have got to count up to a million, one up to a million. It, it, the shortcut still works. It's, oh, I'm just going to pair them up. One and a million is a million and one, and I've got 500,000 pairs of those. It, this is the power of these shortcuts. It doesn't matter how complex the problem gets, you can still um, use that strategy um, to solve the problem. And you know, how would an AI have come up with that? It wouldn't have bothered, as you say, Roger. It, the AI would just say, oh, I, I can add those numbers up very quickly. So my feeling is that um, that is our power, that we are cha we just uh, are lazy and want to find the clever ways to do things. So in a way, the book is um, a, te you know, it's a thank you to my teacher um, who uh, opened up my eyes to what this subject was really about and, and a document of just all the cunning shortcuts we've come up with over 5,000 years of, of, of thinking about problems. So, and here's, um, so here's the other shortcut which is really useful in mathematics because sometimes you realize when you're given a problem you've actually solved it already because it's actually another problem you've done but you've got to change the language. So the little challenge I gave you about handshakes actually is the same problem, just a phrase in a different story. So if you think, if we had all our 201 guests um, uh, here uh, today, we would get the first person up and they would shake, have to shake the hands of all the other 200 people. And then you bring the next person up. Well, they've already shaked hands, so now this second person has to shake the hands of the 199 people that are left. And gradually you get each one up in turn, shake the hands of the people that are left you realize the number of handshakes is adding up the numbers from 1 to 200. And so now you already know how to do that because you pair them up. It's, it's 100 pairs of 201, so the answer is 20,100. And, and so you realize actually sometimes you've solved the problem already, it's just in a completely different guise. And so that's a very common trick of mathematicians and scientists to realize, actually, although this looked very different, it's the same problem, I've already done the work. So. There's another dimension to this, which is that, you know, you've talked about how this uh, propensity is driven by our laziness, but it seems that nature is lazy as well, because light beams uh, choose the, 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 the fastest path between A and B. Um, you know, I spent um, four years making soap films and soap bubbles. They always adopt the lowest energy shape, so, you know, hence, hence a lovely soap bubble and so on. Um, so just just tell us about the the connect the deep connection there between our shortcuts and nature's shortcuts. Yeah, very often uh, to find the right shortcut, nature, uh, nature too. We have this thing in science that nature is by uh, is lazy itself and tries to find low energy solutions. Um, so yeah, the, the soap film is is very interesting. So why is it this beautiful perfect sphere when you blow a bubble? Because the the energy that's to make that bubble is proportional to the surface area and the sphere is the shape with the smallest surface area, so therefore lowest energy. But we realize you can exploit that. So there's um, Fry Otto, an uh, architect, um, made this wonderful um, stadium for the Munich Olympics. And, and I don't know if you've been to Munich, but it's really beautiful, so curvaceous um, uh, kind of layers across the, the stadium. And what he did was to realize, okay, if I'm gonna make these weird shapes, and I need them to be low energy, low tensile strength, what he did was to just create a uh, kind of skeleton structure and then blew bubbles over it. And the bubbles found the low energy solutions. And then he just uh, scaled that up to the architecture and, and used the fact that nature finds these shortcuts to the, 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 the easy solutions. The other one is um, uh, the, the honeybee. Honeybees are my favorite, uh, I think, uh, favorite uh, insect because they're so mathematical. You know, they do this um, uh, waggle dance to tell people. It's basically they're doing trigonometry to tell the other bees what direction to go off. It's absolutely amazing. But they also, you know, why do they make hexagons for their honeycomb? That's quite a sophisticated shape. Um, why don't they just make squares? Surely that would be a sort of more obvious or triangles, hexagons. Um, it turns out making wax is very it requires a lot of energy to, to make the wax it's a, far, a very high 
cost uh, activity. So the honeybee wants to find a shape which uses the least amount of wax to enclose the same sort of areas of um, uh, honeyware. And it turns out, it took us a long time to prove this as mathematicians, but the hexagon is the, the shape where you use the, 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 the length of the sides is the, the smallest such that you would make using le the least amount of wax in order to make that structure. Now, how does nature find these shortcuts? Often, you know, what are they tapping in? What's nature tapping into that it can find these things? Like the light, that's very interesting, the light. You know, this weird, we're all swimming in our swimming pools and that weird effect of your legs seem to be bent when you look down. Because the light is cleverly saying, okay, um, I travel at a different speed in water to air and I want to get to my destination as quickly as possible. Um, so uh, if I'm right, it travels slower in water than air. And so it finds the fastest way to get out of the water and then uses the air as the, the um, way to get to the eye. So this is a little similar to, if I set you a challenge, somebody drowning out at sea and you had to find the optimal point to run across the sand and then swim out. Well, swimming, you're much slower at swimming than, so you actually want to spend more time on the beach before you enter the water. But what's the optimal point at which you should enter? You don't want to go all the way there because you're wasting too much time. Turns out actually what you do is exactly what the light uh, ray would do. It would travel quite a lot on the sand and then go into the sea. We have to solve this using a shortcut which we came up with in the 16th, 17th century, which is the calculus. The calculus is our amazing tool that Newton and Leibniz and energy mathematicians here in India uh, in India came up with, which is our way of finding the shortcuts that nature does. But what nature is doing probably with light is amazing because it's probably tapping into quantum physics in order to be able to do this. Because quantum physics basically it says, let's try out every single path possible to the destination. And so this is kind of uh, the um, uh, superposition of all of these different possibilities. And then it says, then we're going to collapse into the, the path which is the shortest. And that's what we see, the collapse of the wave function. In, so actually, nature is doing things in a, a, it, by trying everything out. But we can't do that. We can't just send everybody off to the beach. You know, you do there, you do there. But in a way, that's what light is doing. It's, it's, it's using quantum physics to tap into, I can try all the possibilities, and then I will collapse into the state which is the, is the least energy, most efficient way to get there. I, I must say, Mark, as we, we could spend the next hour talking about wave function collapse. <laughs> do we really understand it? What's going on there? Well, anyway, yeah. that's a whole nother story. I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to open up to the audience. So I want you to have uh, all your questions ready for us. Um, but the, the idea that nature's um, lazy and that nature's looking for mathematical shortcuts as well, there are some who take a kind of extreme view that actually the whole universe is a mathematical construct and mathematics is the reality, and that we live in a kind of platonic universe. So what, what's your take on it? Do you believe Well, I'm a math mathematician, so I sign up to that, definitely. <laughs> it's all, but you know, it is striking. Every time we try and understand something in nature, uh, time and again, we find that there's some mathematics hiding behind there. Um, if you think about what is the universe made up out of, we understand now it's these things called quarks. Now, nobody's ever seen a quark in isolation. It's really just a piece of mathematics. And the mathematics has helped us to predict new particles um, that we might find in the Large Hadron Collider. So I think it's extraordinary that you know, time and again we find nature. Uh, I, I've talked to some of the guests about Fibonacci numbers, you know, the way things grow around us, the petals on the flower, uh, are again coming back to these uh, sort of amazing numbers which seem to be the key to growth. So why is nature so mathematical? Um, and Actually, it's not completely mathematical. We did, no, a, we did a sunflower growing experiment in our Manchester Museum, and actually you get variations. Yeah the, yeah, yeah, the real world is a bit shit, actually. <laughs> That's why uh, I prefer, sorry, I don't know that. Um, I prefer the, the, uh, my mathematical one. And in a way, Sex, I, now profanity, oh dear. <laughs> no, in a way, you know, I, I, I wanted that. I think that's one of the reasons I was also drawn to mathematics. I found science a bit kind of messy and it wasn't, it wasn't exact. And so there were all these like mistakes it kept on making. And, uh, and the mathematical world, there's a perfection about it. So I, and I do think, uh, you know, one of the big challenges, the, the book I wrote previously to this was called What We Cannot Know. It's sort of a, about the great unknown. You know, are there things that science will never be able to answer? Is the universe infinite, for example? How could we ever know that? I mean, there's actually a cosmic bubble around us beyond which we cannot see because of Einstein's discovery. So obviously a lot of things, but I think one of the really challenging questions is where did all of this come from? 
you know, why is there something rather than nothing? Uh, and often, you know, that then leads you to come up with a, a creator, a god so that sparked the whole thing off. Um, but for me, that always it produces an infinite regress. You know, my kids always go, you know, yeah, but who created the creator? And um, so actually what you need to understand the uh, creation is something which is outside of time. You need something which is atemporal because it needs to always be there. For me, mathematics is that um, because mathematics is there wasn't a moment of creation when suddenly maths. There's moments of creation when we humans discover the maths, but the mathematics. I mean, I'm a real Platonist at heart. The mathematics has always been there. And in a way, what I feel like is that we are a physicalized piece of mathematics. That something has sort of breathed something in. And, and yeah, exactly. Mark, but Mark, is another whole session. Yeah. <laughs> Turing, Gödel, Chaitin. There's actually uncertainty and messiness and unknowables even in the heart of mathematics. Absolutely. Uh -huh. and that, yeah, there is, and that, that I, I talk about that. I mean, in, <laughs> mathematics is very interesting because it even reflects on itself and understands there, uh, there are true statements that we'll never be able to prove are true within our system. So mathematics understands its own limitations, and I think that's quite exciting. But, um, but yeah, I think that uh, it's very interesting. I just, before I came here, I was in uh, Colombia, um, and I got the amazing opportunity to talk to a tribe from the Sierra Nevada. And they came down, and you know they really think they, they understand nature, and they're trying to explain to us the mess we're doing. And I was like, well, how am I going to connect with uh, this, uh, these tribal elders? Um, and one of the things I discovered is they have a whole theory about uh, um, the idea of universal laws, which will be there even if their physical universe disappears. And, and I thought, well, that sounds like mathematics, the idea that you know, if you take away the physical universe, my universe of mathematics would still be there. It doesn't need physicality. Um, and so it's amazing to find this connection with this, uh, these tribal elders. The other interesting was connection. They don't have any uh, written word, or, but number is important to them. And also symmetry. So my own area of research is um, trying to understand the world of symmetry. And they have these wonderful molina, these bags that they make, uh, which women make and weave these patterns, amazing symmetries on the bag. And so we just had this amazing conversation where, uh, and this for me is the exciting thing, it's mathematics is this universal language where I can go and talk to a tribe in Colombia and we just find this connection. And that's why I think there's something lovely about mathematics as a universal storyteller device that we, wherever we go with JLF, that we can find connection. Sometimes the stories are very specific to the culture that they're written in, but this mathematical story I feel is very universal and you know when we JLF goes off into the, the space and visits a, a star system on the other side of the universe our, our novels will be a little bit mysterious to them I'm, I'm but our mathematics I think will be you know we'll be telling them mathematical stories I'm, I'm looking I'm forward to, to the platonic anyway. JLF but but look we, we must let the poor audience get a word in uh, edgeways yeah, sorry I, I, yeah. so we have five minutes for um, deeply mathematical fields medal and Arbel prize standard uh, questions so I hope that's not daunting any of you. Yeah, so there's any, a question okay, at the back. Question over here, fire yeah. away. We'll, we'll get a mic. Common from his throne. This is such a splendid throne. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Has he already taken over? <laughs> Marcus, there was a time when the theory of the Big Bang, beginning of the universe, was probably uncontested. Hawkins wrote the book and so on and so forth. After all, it's a mathematic, math, mathematician's formula. Is it still valid? Yes. And since you, can I ask just yeah. one more and then you can take your time. And since you spoke about the connection between mathematics and intuition, in a sense, the shortcut, which comes spontaneously to some people and never to others. There was in India an ancient school of mathematics called Vedic mathematics. Have you had an opportunity to study that? Because some of the best mathematicians came from India. Let me start with the second question, um, because we actually uh, celebrate India as a wonderful example of how you value mathematics in education in a way that we don't tend to in the UK. People will very um, proudly wear as a badge of honor the fact that they're terrible at maths. And what I enjoy about coming to India, first of all, is that 
people won't do, even if they are bad at maths, they won't, it's like saying I'm illiterate here. Um, uh, and so I, I enjoy the fact that mathematics is valued in a way that it just isn't in the West. And also just the fact that so many, I made a program called The Story of Maths, which was about the history of mathematics um, from uh, ancient Egypt through to the modern day. The most exciting episode in there was the episode where we discovered, uh, we, we told the story of how much mathematics has been discovered in this region. The, the like class zero. Like zero, for example, you, which we talked know, about quite a lot uh, uh, to, uh, during the week. Um, uh, but. Um, you know, there's a very political message here because I think in, in the West we just somehow thought, um, you know, uh, mathematics starts with the ancient Greeks, then everything goes quiet again until Fibonacci comes on the scene. And, and actually those Fibonacci numbers I mentioned, they shouldn't be called Fibonacci numbers because actually Indian musicians had discovered these numbers centuries before Fibonacci and understood that they were helped you to count rhythms in tabla playing. Um, and, and that sh they should be called the Hamashandra numbers, not the Fibonacci numbers. So I think there's that second program that I made was a very political one in actually making people realize that the mathematics has been going on in this region uh, way before things kicked off with Newton and Leibniz. The Vedic mathematics is very interesting, and I have looked at this, um, because what uh, you're encouraging children to think about is almost the underlying algebra which hides behind the numbers. So you find these clever ways to do uh, the arithmetic, um, not by doing something mechanical, but by thinking of the structure of the way the grammar works. And that is what algebra is. It's the underlying grammar of how numbers work. And this is something uh, in India, and then the Arab world came up with the abstract language to be able to articulate. Um, I mean, here's an interesting property. Multiplication tables, we teach our kids them, and they're very boring. But what if you find the interesting patterns inside there? If you take a number and multiply it by itself, like five times five, that's 25. Now take the numbers either side. Four times six is 24. It's one less. This always works. Six times six is 36. Five times seven is 35. You always get one less. So start, you start to think, is that just a coincidence? Well, what if we go really big? Seven times seven, 49. Six times eight, 48. It's always one less. So how do you then uh, express that that's going to happen even if I take a million times a million and an algebra is this kind of magical language which says okay you don't have to look at all of these examples this is uh, why this will always work so so I actually really excited by the Vedic way of thinking because it's already encouraging children to think about these kind of grammatical structures hiding behind numbers um, Marcus we we're, we're almost out of time oh sorry no no you're just pressing buttons give, give, like, give, give us give us a couple of senses on mathematical theories of the universe well, the universe and then, and then maybe one very quick last question from the audience then we better wrap up big the Big Bang the Big Bang is very interesting because that is a, one of our shortcuts which I talk about in the book is the ability to spot patterns read these numbers back into the past and in, more interestingly into the future well, we were doing a session on future tense um, with a lot of politicians but my message will be about the power of mathematics as a way of looking forward but it can also help us to look backwards so we now understand that there's probably a moment when there was a, a singularity a moment of uh, infinite dense energy um, and, and I always was brought up on the idea that that is the beginning of everything, beginning of time. You know, you can't talk about time before the Big Bang. But theories have changed. Roger Penrose, my colleague in Oxford, has started to come up with the idea that there are cycles of time. And if we look deep into the future in deep time, what we discover is there's a moment when everything is decayed such that we lose a sense of scale. Um, you can only measure things if you've got a sort of time. time there's a moment when time will stop. And then without that, there's no way to measure. So the universe, although we thought it was very big, if it's scaleless, it's actually lost its sense of uh, size, and it could be just a singular point again. So Roger is proposing, it's a bit controversial, but I think it's very exciting, that in some ways we have these cycles of time which have been going on infinitely into the past, infinitely into the future, where these big bangs are the moment where the universe loses its sense of scale and, and sort of explodes uh, again. So, um, so the exciting thing is science changes and mutates and new ideas come along, which is what gives it kind of its um, Let, life. Let's just have one last question. Did we have, oh, um, or may, maybe at the front here, actually. Sorry, uh, let, let's... Uh... 
And I hope, I hope it's um, a very brief answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'll try and make this brief. First of all, thank you. You've completely humanised mathematics for me. It was something that I only thought happened in the classroom and the very few chosen geniuses were able to do. So my question is, for somebody like me who has a family, I want to inspire my children. Again, we, in, in the home, we think very much as mathematics as something that happens in the classroom. You know, and the more you study, the better you'll become at it. How do we inspire ourselves and how do we incorporate mathematics into our life? Life on a daily basis as we do kindness, compassion and all of those other things we want to teach our children. Storytelling. Yes, it's, it's about finding the, the sort of doorway into the world of mathematics and because my belief that mathematics is bubbling underneath everything, it's about finding what is your child passionate about? Is it music? Music is full of uh, kind of mathematics hiding there and often people will say I'm a uh, terrible mathematician and then I start to explain what maths is and say, oh but that's something I can connect with, I understand that. Um, so uh, I wrote in particular, I'm going to recommend another book that I wrote, it's called The Number Mysteries which is about uh, the way mathematics is hiding behind music, behind architecture, behind the way we play games um, and this, I was given this kind of uh, I had to do some lectures for children at Christmas time, the Christmas lectures, you might know them. They're Very prestigious. Royal, yeah, started by Faraday in 1825. So it was one of the things I went to as a kid and inspired me. But I was told to pitch these lectures at like 11 to 14 year olds and I found stories to tell. Stories are the best way. And we have some terrific stories in maths, but they don't get told. It's like in the lesson, that they're just giving you spelling and grammar. And if you thought that was English literature, yeah. no wonder you give it up. Our kids are lucky to get Shakespeare or romantic poetry or George Orwell. In maths, we don't do that. We just give them the grammar and no wonder they just give up. So, I remember um, gossiping yeah. with Tim Gowers who got the field medal, which is really one of the most prestigious, if not the most prestigious mathematical prize. And he said, you know, every time I empty the dishwasher, I always think of the optimum route around the kitchen to put the plates away and the cups away. And I just thought it was a very human... Welcome to my life! <laughs> <laughs> anyway, on that surreal note, my goodness me, we could spend all day talking to Marcus. Um, what a renaissance man. What an amazing uh, polymath. And thank you for those questions. We, we could take so many more. And thank you to the JLF for hosting us. We've had a brilliant time. And please give a warm hand to Marcus.